We're going to start the day with a talk from Merit Sikovich, um, who does not need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Merit grew up near uh, Buffalo, New York. She studied at MIT and completed medical school and, and neurology training at Harvard. And she's the founder of the Niels Consortium, the PI of the Neuronext Network, founder and director of the Sean M. Healy and AMG Center for ALS at Mass General. She's the Julianne Dorn Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School, chief of the neurology service at Mass General Hospital. And she is deeply committed to caring for people with ALS the way they should be cared for and to finding a cure for ALS. Um, so with that, Merit uh, is going to talk to us about uh, clinical trials landscape overview. Thank you for being here, Merit. Thank you, James. And I know you're going to keep me, uh, you're supposed to keep me on time, right? That's my job. Yeah. Let me just get this going. So uh, first of all, welcome everybody. Um, this is my favorite conference of all the ALS conferences because it brings together everybody, everybody who cares about ALS, the people living with ALS, their families, uh, the providers, the, the, our industry partners, the foundations, and there's so much going on right now and we need everybody working as one, as, as Kevin really imagined uh, to, to um, get progress. I remember giving these talks when we didn't have anything to talk about, and that is so different right now. Um, I, I do want to kind of just share my disclosures quickly, but then um, leap into like where we are. There have been a lot of trials in ALS in the last you know two decades, but what gives all of us hope is that um, if you look at the uh, the trials, uh, they're they're more often positive now. Um, in the last couple of years, we've seen many positive phase two, three trials, something that we didn't see when we really started trials in 1990, uh, in the mid 1990s. And that is driven by understanding um, the science better uh, and the tools and technologies to study the illness in people living with it and the sheer number of amazing pharma uh, partners that are in this space and the number of people in, the, in academia working on this. So that gives me a lot of hope that we are going to see um, many more drugs come to market for our patients and that they're gonna keep um, having even larger effects. So we, we do have options for people uh, living with ALS today, but we clearly need more. Um, in the United States, we have four um, FDA approved uh, therapies um, that slow the illness. Um, and one also new Dexta that is a symptomatic treatment. Now all of these Drugs are approved in every country, and that is a, um, a challenge and uh, something that's really important for the field to tackle, uh, to have really regulatory consistency around the world so everybody living with ALS can have access to the same drugs. Um, but um, the ones we have now are Rilazole, Radicava, Relivrio, uh, and that's for all forms of ALS, and uh, more recently, Tefersin, our first gene therapy uh, approved in April for people who carry mutations in SOD1. Um, so this is very exciting. Um, all the drugs tackle uh, different parts of the pathway, and uh, uh, we do uh, give uh, all of them to our patients, um, you know, for the sporadic patients, all three of the R's, and for people with genetic form, um, the uh, Tefersin plus the uh, other uh, disease-modifying drugs. So we have options, but we, we need to do much more. What again gives me a lot of hope is that we have this engaged global patient population and advocates and foundations like ALS One. And this wasn't always the case. I'd say really the last five, eight years, um, we have uh, really seen that partnership and we've seen the impact on, um, on, on having those advocates on funding from the federal government, on FDA uh, flexibility and hearing the voice of the patients and for pharma companies, having uh, people living with the ALS come talk to them, come um, talk to their teams to be on their steering committees and to really, again, partner together. Um, my last count, we have over 300 companies in the ALS space. There's probably more. And again, that's so different from even 10 years ago when we could have counted them on one or two hands at most. We also have these global trial networks that are working together um, to do trials more efficiently, from, to learn from each other and to innovate, much like you know the cancer field did maybe 20 years ago. So we have platform trials going on, basket trials. We have biomarker-driven studies. We actually even have the first drug approval to first and based on a biomarker, and we're starting pre-symptomatic studies. So it is a hot and exciting field that I think is going to yield even more 
positive treatments. Did want to just take a moment um, for those of you on the phone, on the Zoom that don't know Niels. Uh, I urge you to get get involved with Niels. This is a, a consortium of over 150 centers, um, mainly U.S. but also Canada, Middle East, South America. Really a global network that works together to bring access to trials closer to where people with the illness live, to innovate on trials, to partner with pharma, to um, learn about the illness, to develop new outcome measures, new biomarkers. And we're funded uh, by ALS1 as well as some other foundations. Um, and we have um, an annual meeting, but lots of opportunities for pharma to come to us if they want advice on preclinical models, on clinical trial design, on um, site selection, any, anything you need to make your trial success, our group would like to be uh, helping you and working so that no one is reinventing the wheel. So I wanted to talk about two of the new drugs briefly. I know you're gonna hear about them in uh, more detail later in, in the symposium, but um, you know the approval of Relivrio was really a game changer in the ALS field. This was um, one of the first studies that the FDA approved on a single study. It's a combination of two um, drugs, sodium phenobutrate and uh, Tutka. One of them works on ER stress, uh, that's the sodium phenobutrate, and one works on the mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, that's the, the Tutka. I'm going to use the easier name for it. Um, and the idea here was that each one uh, works on an important part of the biology, but maybe they would work better together. And in fact, the preclinical data does suggest that they're additive. And so this uh, uh, new company, Amelix, came to Niels to ask for advice, uh, both on the preclinical data and the clinical trial design. And they partnered with uh, my um, my colleague, Dr. Paganoni, and Niels uh, to design this uh, clinical trial. And there were 25 sites in the US. This was initially co-funded by um, two uh, foundations, the ALS Association and ALS Finding Cure as well as obviously some funds from Amelix, um, but it was a, a well done study that then led to you know, this single study approval in the US and Canada. Um, just the highlights, uh, there was a statistically significant and clinically significant uh, slowing of the loss of function by about 25% seen in the double blind six month period. And there was also survival benefit that was picked up in the um, uh, open label extension period that was really well done and is a model now for other trials where during that open label extension, people were remain blinded to their initial uh, assignment during the double blind. And we got full ascertainment on outcomes on all participants. So that in a way you could use this as a, a confirmatory uh, trial. And so many of the trials are now designed in this way uh, to keep learning both about safety and long-term outcomes, but minimizing the time that people living with ALS are on uh, placebo. So there is a, uh, a second study going on in uh, mainly in Europe. There's a few uh, US participants, and this is um, uh, driven by both um, a requirement in Canada and also a requirement in Europe. Um, and it's called Phoenix. It's larger than the, the study we did and longer in a little broader criteria. And the, that study is fully enrolled and results are expected in 2024. The other um, really amazing um, approval that happened uh, recently was the approval of uh, Tufersen or Kalsadi is an, the name for it now. And this is an anti nucleotide treatment for SOD1 ALS. And I just, I put this picture up of Susan, who was the first person I've ever cared for with ALS in 1994, when um, she had, um, she and her family had the SOD1 mutation. Dr. Robert Brown had and his colleagues had just discovered that first gene for ALS. Um, and um, I made her a personal promise to keep fighting this illness until we're until it's cured. And, and I'm so excited that we have a treatment for the form of ALS that she had. And that it's taught us so much about all types of ALS. So this study was approved based on an accelerated uh, approach based on a, a remarkable lowering of a biomarker neuro neurodegeneration neurofilament. It was about a 50% lowering of that. Um, in addition, there was a slowing of the loss of function that was seen in the double bind period. And also in that open label extension, there were about 40% of participants who had stabilization and improvement in strength. So what we learned here uh, was that we, we do have a new biomarker that, that might be able to predict uh, clinical success. 
Um, and it might might not be a universal biomarker, might not work in all drugs, but in this case, it, it, it was really phenomenal. And you'll hear more from Tim Miller, the PI of that later in this conference. We also learned that um, stopping the illness and, re and reversal is possible. And we knew that was theoretically possible, but now we've seen it. Uh, many of us have seen people uh, in the trial who got better. And that, again, gives hope. But we have to do more. We have to learn why not everybody did. And uh, what what um, are there even better ways to tackle this particular uh, form of, of ALS? But we also learned that we could use that same technology, the antisense oligonucleotide, for other uh targets. And so, in fact, there are two um, antisense oligonucleotide studies in sporadic disease, one trying to lower ataxin-2 by Biogen and one increasing stethmin-2 um, by Curalis. So that same gene therapy technology was so important here is going to help us in other um, in sporadic disease as well. So a lot of learning here. There is now a, um, another study um, with pre-symptomatic people carrying SOD1 to see if uh, early intervention before symptoms might delay onset. And that is, again, a pivotal change and something so important in our field to start to think about prevention trials. So there's a lot more going on and I won't review all of these, but I, I do wanna say that we do, again, have more drugs that are turning out positive in their initial trials. Uh, there's now two studies of methylcobalamin with some positive results. There's a European study of IL-2 with positive results. And there's many, many other trials enrolling now and whose results we're going to see in 2024. Um, because of the sheer number of companies in this space and the number of of, of trials that need to be done, um, the Northeast ALS Consortium and Healy Center really thought a couple of years ago that we needed a new way to screen through the drugs uh, efficiently and develop the first platform trial. And you're going to hear a little bit about this from uh, Dr. Uh, Babu. So I'll just briefly uh, say that the old way of testing one drug at a time is fine when you don't have a big pipeline, but it's terribly inefficient when you have a big pipeline like we do in ALS. And the idea really borrowed from the cancer field is to build a platform approach where you can test multiple drugs. You can share the infrastructure, share the placebos. You can um, add and drop drugs uh, quickly and you can save costs by about third time by about 50% and the number of people um, that need to be on placebo by two thirds. So it, it, it was crying out to do this in the ALS field. And so we, did um, start this trial. We had a lot of input from people living with ALS, from the FDA, from pharma partners who are ready to go into phase two, three trials and foundations. This trial has enrolled faster than any trial I've seen uh, in my 30 years in ALS. And that's because it's very patient centered and it's about uh, really hearing the need for speed and efficiently, efficiency for this really serious illness. Um, so uh, when someone comes into the platform trial, they are randomized to one of the open uh, drugs, what we call regimen. There's then a second randomization to active drug or placebo. We've designed it to be three to one, a six month duration with um, a blinded um, um, active treatment extension period. Uh, so that we can also look at long-term effects. We've taken a slightly broader group of participants um, and we are powered to be able to see a 30% a or more slowing um, of loss of function. We have, um, we're up to our seventh um, uh, drug and, and just to, to highlight that we have results from the first four. So again, in, the, in a short period of time, we were able to get answers to four drugs rather than the traditional approach would have been one drug. The first drug was stopped early for futility. Uh, that's the leukoplan. The second one for dipostat was clearly negative. Um, the third and fourth one have positive uh, results in some of the secondary outcome measures um, for clean it's survival and time to in clinically important events like feeding tube or use of respiratory support. And they're um, graduated to um, designing and going forward to phase three trial. Predopidine had positive effects on measures of speech and bulbar function, uh, as well as in sub subsets of, of people with faster course also in function, and they are also designing a phase three trial. So as a, as a screening tool, it was very successful in the short period of time to go through four drugs. Uh, two uh, were negative and two are proceeding to phase three. We are in closeout phase for triolose regimen E and should have those results soon. We are actively enrolling in F and G. F is with uh, Calico and Amvi, and G is with Denali. And we are working with some additional companies to launch uh, in 2024. 
So I'll just say that um, the drug pipeline is so robust and it's growing and we're getting more and more positive results, which again is being driven by the science and understanding the science and having better drugs and targets. We're getting more creative on these designs, um, which we really have to, uh, to be able to go through this big pipeline. We have a huge, amazing patient community that's engaged with us so that they, we have their feedback on trials um, and they learn about trials and they're advocating for resources as you know, there was an amazing bill of uh, called Act for ALS, $100 million a year for ALS. It's funding both research and compassionate use access programs, which is uh, additive to what the Department of Defense and NIH are really already fund for ALS. Um, we're thinking about how do we prevent the illness? How do we reverse the symptoms? And I want to end by saying that every spring we, we get uh, companies together who are getting ready for phase two or three trials in ALS to talk to the NEALS leaders as well as the Healy and AMG Center um, investigators so that we can learn from you and you learn from us and, and uh, talk about the next steps for not just the platform trial, but for trials in general in ALS. So I hope uh, many of you will join us. There'll be uh, more uh, information about the dates and invitations coming out uh, in the next month or so. Um, none of this is done alone. This is an amazing community that works together to do the best for uh, people living with ALS. And thank you. Thank you very much, Merritt. That was a great overview of kind of how things have changed. And and um, I mean, it's remarkable, truly remarkable. I remember having a conversation with you maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago when we had our sort of two two trials running at the same time at our center. And I said, how are we gonna, how are we gonna manage this? And it's just a completely different landscape now. Um, we have time for maybe one or two questions uh, before moving on to our next speaker. 